The Flanier's vision of the city, according to Benjamin, is phantasmagoric. Benjamin argues that it is a dreamlike vision similar to that provided in theatrical entertainment. He also comes up with Marx's figurative description of the commodity as having the character of a religious fetish, an article that derives its magical position from the inventive faculty of the human brain which lends magical powers to it and at the same time reveres the fetish as a self-governing object. Benjamin finds a similarity between how humans create phantasmagoric experiences that appear to possess a life of their own and Marx's theory of the commodity attaining the semblance of an independent life of its own as a consequence of the structure of the social relations that lie at its origin. The advent of modern flaneri is not, however, political. In his The Condition of the Working Class in England, written in 1844, Friedrich Engels charts out the city of Manchester street by street, house by house, using detail that is almost forensic in character. Baudelaire's wanderings around Paris are carried out in a way that is more abstract and poetic. Although Baudelaire's Paris was changed irreversibly in the mid-19th century by Osman's ambitious project of urban revitalization, for Baudelaire, it is still Paris more than any other city that is quintessentially associated with Flannery. The function that the Flanier performs is, in a sense, symbolic. Physical or topographical peregrinations work as a parallel to intellectual explorations, and it can be conjectured that the spirit of the Flanier is alive in the intellectual inquisitiveness of the Bohemian. The Bohemian Flanier is privileged, and he uses his comparative prosperity to explore diverse ideas and lifestyles. Baudelaire instituted a tradition that progresses through the early modernists to the surrealists before finally arriving to the situationists. Baudelaire's Flannery also has affinities with Guy Debord's situationist interventions and his notions of the derive and the spectacle. A derive, which translates as drift, is the medium through which psychogeographies are accomplished a sort of an unplanned walk, generally through an urban or marginal expanse, with the psychogeography involving the creation of a mental map by the walker as he wanders aimlessly, which in Debo's words depends on the walker seeing and being drawn into events, situations and images by an abandonment to wholly unanticipated attraction. Benjamin's most full treatment of the flaneur can be found in his essay the Paris of the Second Empire in Baudelaire, first published in German in 1938 and in the never-completed book Charles Baudelaire, a lyric poet in the era of high capitalism. The Arcades Project was published long after Benjamin's death. It was published in German in 1982 and in English in 1999. The posthumous publications continued Benjamin's relevance in the field of contemporary critical theory and gave new impetus to the study of Flannery and ushered in a revival of the Flannery as an icon of modernity. Benjamin's conceptualization of the modern stroller as the avant-garde Flannery is based on his reading of the figure of the artist Flannery in Baudelaire's poetry and prose. His understanding of the flaneur is by and large materialist. It focuses on the importance of the new architectural visual aesthetic in 19th century Paris, of which the arcades constituted a foremost part. This understanding has been critiqued by some authors. For example, in her article, Walter Benjamin's Myth of the Flaneur, Martina Loster contends that Benjamin has mostly ignored the significance of panoramic literature in determining the type thus undermining the extent to which these typologies help thematize the very process of observation. The arcades were constructed in the first decades of the 19th century and the boulevards beginning under the supervision of Préfet Robuto and continued even more persistently by Baron Osman, whose inclusive design transformed the street into an interior. 
The construction of the boulevards and their use of, of the urban masses made the flaneur into a man of the crowd, although there lies profound irony in which Benjamin rather capriciously interpreted and appropriated the figure as someone disengaged from the crowd, an adversarial figure whose pace and unhurried attitude remonstrate against the painstaking industriousness of the marketplace. There is a kind of reciprocity between the flaneur and urban space. The city is reproduced and reinvented through the flaneur's peripatetic activities, as Michel de Sarceau and Henri Lefebvre have pointed out. The emergence of the flaneur coincided with the advent of the commercial press of the July monarchy and the rise of journalism. The feuilleton, the verbal sketch, the visual caricature, these forms of public expressions helped instantiate Flanier writing. Indeed, the Flanier's openness to fleeting sensual impressions and individual reflection offered themselves to subjective and fragmentary writing that is not essentially plot-driven. The art of Flanieri is primarily contemplative and it can manifest itself both in poetry or prose poetry and documentary prose owing to its attention to detail. With respect to the latter, Flanier writing has clear affinities with the realist novel. For instance, the protagonist of La Ventre de Paris by Emile Zola, Florent, wandered through the streets and the course of his fictional life is seen to be determined by chance encounters. The same might be said of Georges Duoa, the central character of Bellamy, the second novel by French author Guy de Maupassant. There are certain motives in Franz Hessel's Spatzieren in Berlin that are central to Benjamin's idea of the flaneur, such as, on the one hand, enjoyment derived from plunging oneself in the crowd and observing people, and on the other hand, being observed with misgiving for the keen analysis of urban physiognomies reveals a kinship with the affairs of criminals and detectives. It was Hessel who introduced Benjamin to the Kunst des Spatzieren Gehen in Paris and was his co-author for an essay he had planned to write on the arcades. The affinity between Hessel's first-person observer in the Berlin sketches and Benjamin's third-person flaneur in his later works is hardly surprising. In effect, Benjamin's review of Spatzieren in Berlin establishes an important journalistic connection in the evolution of his idea of modernity as it was to be delineated in his essays on 19th century Paris from the 1930s and in the Arcades project, his fragmentary masterwork with which these essays are connected in one way or the other. The Arcades project offers arbitrary insights into the methodological implication of the flaneur. The wide range of textual scraps gathered in it comprises Benjamin's own aphoristic comments as well as quotations from modern cultural studies and also extracts from 19th century literature about modern spectacles and novelties such as arcades and department stores, panoramas, exhibitions, fashion and gaslight. The perspective from which the observations are made appears to be that of an ambling spectator who has fashioned himself as a collector of mental notes taken on leisurely city walks. These notes are sometimes published in newspaper supplements as witty sketches or essays about modern urban life. The points of view in several essays written by Benjamin in the 1930s look like observations of a flaneur the spectator who often takes pleasure in immersing himself in the ostentatious world of high capitalist progress. The figure can be seen as a kind of viewing device through which Benjamin articulates his own theoretical discoveries about modernity that by and large unite in a Marxist critique of commodity fetishism. He draws heavily on Hegelian Marxist dialectical forms and develops his critique in order to expose the secret apparatuses of capitalism which offer the key to revolutionary change. As a spectator and connoisseur of market fluxes and at the same time as someone on a scouting mission in the consumer's dominion, the flaneur is perfectly poised to record the process of commodification. 
This is how the 20th century theorist of modernity derives his authority from the assessments of the 19th century Flaneur in his attempts to surmount alienation, to turn it into a tangible non-theoretical image of the utopian possibilities intrinsic to industrial capitalism. This coincides with the exact moment when the standard signs of modernity such as arcades, gaslight and panoramas are vanishing fast. The 19th century Flaneur bequits his ability to seize and record his own dynamic present to the 1930s philosopher of culture who embodies a past that is present in a flash of insight. His inventive and ingenious thinking, presented in aphoristic imageries, is directed towards unleashing modernity's potentiality of revolutionary change. However, this authorization cruxes on the supposition that the 19th century Flaneur's assessment, however piercing with respect to the uniqueness and strangeness of the things he witnesses, is curtained, and that it takes a retrospection of the future critic to emancipate modernity from the shackles of the bourgeois false consciousness of its early observers. Benjamin articulates this process of making modernity aware of itself in terms of awakening from a dream, and his essential image signifying that dream is that of the phantasmagoria. The Flaneur here perceives his familiar urban environment not as an authentic social alienation, but as an alienation caused by a curtain of illusion, which is that of urban crowd. Phantasmagorias were a form of visual entertainment that predates the cinema, a prototype of the Magic Lantern's show, which involved projecting an image onto a diaphanous screen from behind, with the projector moving backwards and forwards, thereby producing in the audience a sensation of gothic excitement through the impression of an approaching or vanishing figure. Benjamin characterizes the Flaneur's vision of the city as phantasmagoric. He suggests that this vision is overshadowed by the dream factory vision prevalent in the early entertainment industry. Marx's figurative depiction of commodity in terms of a religious fetish is also crucial to Benjamin. The commodity's assumption of a magical and fetish-like status and its appearance to the community as an autonomous, venerable object. The phantasmagoric facade, carefully crafted and given the appearance of an almost living entity, forms a part of Marx's list of images when he describes the seeming independence of the commodity ensuing from the abstract character of social relationships that lie at its origin. Benjamin's Flaneur moves between the hinterlands of capitalist reification, observing the familiar city as a phantasmagoria, a self-governing, potentially shocking and fear-inducing world of objects lying beyond itself. The shock that urban alienation could cause is alleviated by the phantasmagoric curtain, the crowd in the street which veils a familiar yet strange city in an unformulated nexus. Apparently the insinuation is that the urban crowd, itself a putatively upsetting presence, absolves the flaneur as one who is at ease and at home in it, obtaining an aesthetic delight by going about incognito and consequently not being completely exposed to the shudder of alienation. Conversely, the flaneur is rendered a figure of great ambivalence by being at home in what is most certainly not home, and by inspecting what is familiar through a defamiliarizing mask. He is sensitive to the changes in subject-object relationships caused by industrialization, but at the same time he is deluded about them. The Flaneur experiences the streets as an interior, and this renders his delusions about the shifts primarily spatial. His sensorium is visually and tactilely inundated with an assortment of facades, of arcades, panoramas, conservatories, living rooms, music halls, cabinets of curiosities or botanical collections, and last but not the least, the great exhibition hall. All times all spaces, all contemporary social phenomena are united by the interior and their convergence in the singular moment or gaze and the insights that it offers. This gaze intoxicates the flaneur. 
he internalizes the world offered to his senses and a clock starts keeping time inside him as it were suggesting this act of bodily incorporation the street becomes an apartment for the flaneur the shiny enameled company signs are as good and perhaps even better an item of wall decoration as an oil painting is for the citizen in the salon walls are like the desk against which he sticks his notepad newspaper kiosks are his libraries and cafe terrace aureoles from which he looks down on his household after work the city dweller whose whose supposed political superiority over the country has been widely articulated throughout the 20th century tries to bring the country into the city the city expands into the panoramas of the landscape as it does for the strollers in a more subtle way the appearance of the street as an interior in which the phantasmagoria of the stroller collapses is difficult to separate from the gas lighting benjamin thus construes a relation of interdependence and reciprocity between on the one hand the exact recording of a 19th century milieu which is characterized by an unparalleled reification and a nearly hallucinatory state of the mind on the other he does so visibly in order to emphasize fetishization as a constituent module of the urban resident's apprehensions and desires it is worthwhile to note that benjamin describes fetishization as the endowment of inert objects with sex appeal appropriating the marxian category in psychological terms the flaneur's association with the domain of commodities and his location amidst the ruthless competitiveness of the marketplace are debated in an abstruse way so as to underline his function as a kind of portal or threshold he is certainly not devoid of the potential but he lacks an insight which is free of illusion and which is necessary to identify his own commodification the connection between flaneur and the writer or artist of modernity was clearly made by baudelaire long before benjamin with analogous emphases placed on the loss of self and its ecstasies indeed to follow benjamin's essays on baudelaire is useful in tracing the theoretical roots of the 19th century flaneur decisively to baudelaire particularly baudelaire's interpretation of edgar allan poe's story the man of the crowd in the essay the painter of modern life in connection with the draftsman constantin guise in the essay baudelaire talks about losing the self in the crowd as a prerequisite for artistic creativity benjamin quotes baudelaire in the arcades project according to baudelaire for the ideal flaneur for the passionate observer it is an immense pleasure to take up residence in number in the undulating in the movement in the fugitive and the infinite being away from home and yet feeling at home everywhere to see the world to be in the center of the world and to remain hidden from the world these are some of the pleasures of these independent passionate impartial minds whom language can only clumsily define the observer is a prince who enjoys his incognito status everywhere for benjamin it is an insatiable sign of the non-ego which at every moment renders and expresses it in images more vivid than life itself always unstable and fleeting it is important to note that the passage from baudelaire quoted by benjamin refers exclusively to the painter of modern life constantin guise and that baudelaire does not at all associate the flaneur with the unknown man of the crowd cited by the narrator in poe's story the people in the street are capable of having unrestricted insight as baudelaire seems to suggest in his essay on visual artist the man of the crowd is not the flaneur per se it is rather the observing narrator who could be categorized thus benjamin however contrives the conspicuous misreading of poe's unsettled unknown man as a flaneur the man of the crowd becomes indistinguishable for him from the flaneur towards a later stage in his trajectory of writing about the figure benjamin claims that baudelaire perceived him as a bohemian exile in poe's story hiding in the crowd moving about the city anonymous and yielding eventually to the enticement of commodities in the consumerist wilderness of a department store <laughs>